So welcome everybody to QBN Quantum Leadership Session. This is the first uh, session in this year, and this is topic on quantum computing status quo. We will have uh, six esteemed speakers from different uh, companies, and I'm sure there will be really interesting topics for you and talks there. After each uh, talk, you can ask questions, and it will be a Q&A session. These sessions are supported by Bio Innovative Digital Zirong, and uh, we wish you all to enjoy it. So to start, let's just take a look at the agenda. We will start by some interview from the QBN and some industry, quantum industry report introduction. Then we will have our speakers talk. We will start by uh, Professor Gerard Hirschen and then go on with the Jonathan Burnett, Christian Benio, Carl Ducats, Florentin Reiter, and finally Kimberly Tishu. Uh, just to start, I would like to say some spirits of the Cuban uh, sessions. Uh, I will ask you all to change your name syntaxes to full name and then in parentheses uh, company name. So it will be easier for all of us to contact to each other. Uh, please turn on your camera, at least for the Q&A session and also for connecting to the others. And uh, you can connect with uh, everybody via chat. It's uh, Okay, it's uh, available for us to use the uh, in-person chat. This meeting will be live streamed and it's uh, available on YouTube. You will already have received the YouTube link. And if not, you can also check it out on our website. <clears throat> After this meeting, you will have the presentation in the QBN portal. And as said for the Q&A session, you can use the hands up button or write your question in the Q&A box below. For now, I will uh, hand in the scene to Johannes Verst, our CEO. He will introduce you to QBN and say some words about it. I will stop the sharing. Yeah, thank you very much, Lena. Um, also, welcome from my side and to be late. Happy World Quantum Day to all of you. So um, it's great to see so many quantum enthusiasts here and uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, developing quantum technologies in an entire industry means um, for all, us, uh, all of us to live, I would say, on a steep learning curve, always focused on diving, uh, driving our R&D, our business, industry applications, governmental relations, and the market development. And the World Quantum Day, I think, is a great opportunity to take a step back and celebrate what we already achieved as a community. And I think this is quite a lot. So I'm really looking forward uh, to learn more about the status quo, uh, about the NISC technology, the different quantum technology platform, quantum computing platforms, and the platform access. And I am very excited to hear uh, from our speakers more about their great visions, innovative solutions, success stories, collaborative efforts, showcasing in total their quantum leadership position. And before that, let me briefly present you QBN, <clears throat> which is the perfect platform for technological advancements and business acceleration for the quantum industry. So we at QBN have the mission to build a resilient quantum economy. That means as the world leading innovation network and think tank for quantum technologies, we are dedicated to establish quantum for good to tackle global uh, and societal challenges. That means <clears throat> QBN serves as a platform for collaboration, intelligence, and business. Um, together with our members, we foster the trilogue between industry, science, and politics. Uh, we accelerate the technology advancements, commercialization, and industry adoption of quantum technologies, and together drive the growth and competitiveness of the quantum industry. And this is, if I say we, so we are currently Sorry. We are currently more than 19 members. Sorry for the presentation. Oops. So we are currently more than 90 members from 19 countries. <clears throat> so you see here all the important world leading quantum startups, RTOs, governmental initiatives, large companies and SMEs, also investors. So we cover the entire value chain for the different pillars of quantum technologies. 
And as a network, we already looking back to almost four years of a great success story, growing from zero to this more than 90 international members. We have currently six technology working groups, <clears throat> uh, different other formats like the quantum leadership session for marketing support and to increase the awareness of quantum technologies. We have a huge outreach, uh, online reach on social media, um, a global event presence at different conferences and fairs with joint booths and so on. We initiated far more than 100 partnerships already, brokered or initiated more than 200 million of investment, private and public. Um, and we have, of course, close relationships um, with the government on the European level and on the national level. And as such, <clears throat> we drive the growth of the quantum industry. Here you see a few impressions of uh, things we already did. And um, it's really about doing things together, international collaboration, meeting people and yeah, drive the things together. As I mentioned, we have international members. So the QBN membership is international. Um, you see here the distribution, um, more than a little bit more than 50% of our members are startups as I think um, they are the, the main drivers of the commercialization of quantum technologies. And we need to support them. We need to bring them together with end users, with um, other collaboration partners. And we need to do this on an international level. So if you are interested <clears throat> in joining the network, reach out, um, surf on our website on the membership to learn more about it. And yeah, we would be happy to collaborate with all of you. In the end, I can only say, let's build a resilient and sustainable quantum economy together. So this is the most important thing. And if you are interested in our activities, um, job openings, news, <clears throat> press releases, events, and so on, follow us on uh, LinkedIn and X, and also subscribe on our YouTube channel to uh, stay up to date also with the quantum leadership sessions. And yeah, before I hand over back to you, Zainab, I would like to make a quick re uh, request to the speakers. So since we have um, so many young talents and experts here in the audience, and also watching later on demand. <clears throat> it would be great to hear um, in or after your talk, in a short remark, what do you see currently as the biggest challenge of the industry? And what can all these people in the audience, the students, companies, RTOs, and so on, do for you to help you continue moving at top speeds? So, and with this, back to you, Zainab, and I think you have a little sneak peek for the audience, right? Yeah, yeah, I have kind of a news for them. So I will do it by sharing my screen again and bring our presentation to Alice's very exciting part for me. Here's about the quantum industry report. So at QBM, we decided to prepare an industry report for you, which shows the latest advancement and trends in shaping the quantum industry. For this, we have collected feedback from the global quantum community. So I can say we have sent the distributed the survey to around uh, 4,000 people. I mean, I, from people, we mean the active players in quantum industry. And in this in report, we decide to forecast uh, future and growth opportunities beside the comprehensive analysis of quantum te technology players and industry trends to give you a estimated time for the publishing of this uh, report we can say it will be published on may 2024 and the access to this report is free for all cuban members and also non-members and this uh, report there is something really interesting is that uh, we had uh, sent a survey to people as said and there are some a uh, few results from this report that sound so exciting for us so we decided to share it before head to you one of them is that the most active technology in quantum industry is quantum computing also more than half players expect more up to 10 percent revenue growth to this year means that the most of them saw their situation good in this market and also they believe that commercialized quantum technology will hit the market in 10 years at this point, there's an interesting graph for you. This shows uh, what quantum community believes about the quantum technology entering different set sectors. 
As you can see here, for some areas like uh, cryptography, defense, and security, people are optimistic and believe in three or maybe five years, we can claim that quantum technology has entered there. Um, however, there is uh, this idea that for manufacturing, uh, which is a very uh, important topic for all the industry and also healthcare, quantum technology has a long way to reach and some are even more skeptical about oil and gas and meeting the quantum technology and they do not see a horizon for that. This was my part about the quantum industry report that we are trying to prepare. I will not uh, go more on depth, but I will really encourage you to read it when it's published. It's less than a month, so you will see very exciting news and graphics there. Uh, by this, I will uh, stop talking. I will give the scene to our esteemed speaker. Our first one will be Gerard Hellstern. Uh, who will we give talk? Gerard, you can now share your screen. I will stop it. And we are ready to hear from you. Okay, thanks a lot, Senap. Thanks a lot for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk to you, to say a few words about uh, quantum computing, the status quo. I now try to share my screen. Okay, so hopefully now you see all my screen yes, uh, with my slides. Okay, 15 minutes about the status quo of, of quantum computing is tough. So I thought what, what is interesting for you, what can I show you? Um, first of all, a little bit about me. I'm a um, physicist, uh, originally studied physics a long time ago, nuclear physics. Then I spent 20 years in banking and finance industry, then returned six years ago to academia uh, to, to finance again. Now I try to bridge the gap between quantum computing between the, the technology and the, the business, the application in finance. Um, so that's my field, that's my mission, so to say, to connect the, the two worlds, the world of business and the world of uh, quantum computing. I would like to start with a Chinese saying, may you live in interesting times. The people are not sure actually if this is a curse or if this is a blessing, but nevertheless, um, I think concerning quantum computing, we at the moment definitely live in interesting times, not only from an academic uh, point of view, which is a little bit, I mean, more comfortable to, to, to stand at a sideline and, and, and watch it. But I think also concerning the different players in the game, we are definitely living in interesting times. There are so many uh, things around and so many topics and so many um, um, evolutions in the last months and weeks. So I tried to pick out to pick out a, a few of them to 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 bring it to shed a light on the different um, the different developments. So what's the status of quantum computing at the moment in a nutshell? So quantum computing, as you all know, is a research topic now for more than 30 years. There are a lot of theoretical promises around. You all know Shaw's algorithms and Krober's algorithms. We know this theoretical promises about speed ups and opportunities. Uh, and people thought for a long time, okay, these are theoretical hopes, but they will never, maybe never will, um, will come to, to, to real life. But since 29, so, so since, uh, um, 2015, the hope uh, started that this become true within a reasonable time. IBM basically started to to build the the first uh, yeah the first commercially quantum computer. We started with the NISC world, and at the moment, roundabout, we have about 100 qubits around for playing with them. They are of course error prone, but uh, people thought and people hoped. Maybe even in this NISC world and with this error prone qubits, we can get an advantage. We will reach an advantage. Uh, there will be an advantage or quantum usefulness. And people tried hard and fight hard to, to reach this goal. There are a lot of proof of concepts around in different industries and in different applications where people show that quantum computing can be used to solve certain problems. It's possible to use quantum computing, That's, that works, so we can say that's fine, this works. But the, I, from my point of view, the essential question, um, is there really an advantage? Should we use quantum computing or must we, use quantum, must we use quantum computing to solve the problem? Up to now, there's no conclusive proof. 
there is no clear demonstration that in this NISC world and this, with this NISC technology, it is possible yet. And this is a little bit frustrating, I would say. This is not the news or the, the message or the, the, the status we hoped a, a couple of years ago. We all thought it will be possible within one year or two years, which, and at the moment, as I will show you, it's not, it's not the case. In the last month, there were a couple of bad news around. So I once want to start with the bad news uh, about the status of quantum computing. There was a paper in the end of last year uh, about variational quantum algorithms. And variational quantum algorithms are the, uh, the workhorse of quantum computing in NISC time. Here you have, so you have a quantum, quantum circuit, a quantum algorithm with a lot of uh, free parameters. And then you tune the parameters you, to solve your problem, essentially. And in this paper, Many, uh, a group of the, I mean, the leading researchers in the field, they proved or they shown that um, either such a variational approach is not trainable because of the barren blood hose or it's trivial. I mean, trivial in the sense of it's classical, uh, you can solve it with classical uh, methods. And this is, of course, uh, a problem because from this point of view or from this direction, it's very hard to, to see any quantum advantage with variational um, quantum algorithms. And they, or they even pose the questions why we need to rethink variational quantum computing. And I think this is um, this made clear. It's really very subtle to, um, to hope for an advantage, to hope for a usefulness. The second bad news from my point of view came in March this year when people from Xanadu um, published a benchmark study where they looked into uh, quantum machine learning. In the last years, many papers in quantum machine learning were published where people claimed that there is a kind of quantum advantage when you use uh, quantum computing for machine learning, not all, not not in in terms of speed, but in terms of accuracy, in terms of you get better results, you get your, your results are more accurate than using uh, classical methods. Maybe you need less data. There were some claims, and these people from Xanadu they analyzed these studies and compared them to the benchmark study, and at the end. Basically, they showed ah, there is no clear advantage of quantum machine learning in comparison to classical machine learning. Of course, you always you can get a, a quantum machine learning algorithm when comparing to a, I mean, I would say to an easy classical machine learning algorithm. Then you see a kind of advantage, but overall, systematically, it's not, I mean, it's not trustable to say, we see that quantum machine learning is at the moment superior to classical machine learning. And this is, of course, not, not good for the community uh, because many people hoped it. Many people hoped that it will be possible to find this application here in machine learning. You know, AI, big topic at the moment. And pe some people hope there will be a, a point here where, where, where quantum machine learning uh, will, be, will be useful in the game. The next bad news um, comes from this paper, also from this year, Efficient Tensor Network Simulation. Um, and this is a kind of, I mean, it's a, it's one paper out of, of many. It's, I would call it a fruitful competition between quantum algorithms, IBM, and the tensor network community. So basically each time IBM, especially, but also other companies, who come around and say, oh, now we have here the quantum advantage, the quantum usefulness. We have now here the algorithm. This can't be simulated classically in millions of years. These tensor network guys come around and it takes them a couple of months or a couple of weeks uh, uh, even and, and show it's possible with tensor networks. And this is uh, from, from an academic point of view, it's a quite a fruitful and a good competition because it it challenges quantum computing. It challenges and 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 helps to really to uh, to make the statements clear and to um, to help to get a better picture of what is possible, what is not possible. So from these three papers I showed, you can say ah the world is not good. It's bad. It is even even worse. Here a slide from John Breskill, the godfather of quantum computing. He, 
last year, um, he basically came to the conclusion that within quantum computing, error correcting or fault tolerant qubits are necessary. Probably no quick win. So his he his message was to hope for a quantum advantage, quantum quantum usefulness within NISC is maybe not possible. So these are the bad news on the one side. What are the good news? There are good news. The good news, the first good news, there is so much money around, so much money around. Millions of money or billions of money in the world are invested in quantum technologies. This money is used to, to do research, to build up companies. Many clever people all over the world are dealing with quantum computing, looking into the different topics. And some of these clever guys and clever women and clever men, they, 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 they are, they, 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 they foster the, 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 the developments. There are, there are advantages and there are good news also in the last months or the last weeks even. Um, at the end of March, there was this Nature publication, again from IBM, um, which uh, demonstrated maybe a lot of error-free qubits are around the corner. They showed that doing uh, error correction is maybe not so costly as we expected before, and maybe it's easier to come to this world where we're not in this NISC world anymore, so in a world where we have many, many uh, error-free qubits where we can play around and, and use them for our calculations. Um, there are other there were other news in the last weeks. Microsoft last week uh, made an announcement that they they managed it to build uh, four logical qubits out of about thirty physical qubits, so a factor seven to eight, and that's not bad actually. I mean, a factor seven to eight between um, between physical qubits and and, and error free qubits, that's fine. That would be that's an that's an order of magnitude where we can work. Of course, it's a long it's a long uh, way before we get or before we have thousands of, of good or error free qubits but uh, but at least it's the beginning it's the start of this of this route another good news there's a lot of also fruitful competition the race i would say a race started again for the best quantum hardware there are many tech different technologies around, not only the superconducting qubits from uh, IBM and um, Rigetti, there are other techniques, iron, um, iron techniques, Kera is very, very active in this field, the photonic world, of course. So there's a race, there's an, there's an, an um, yeah, an, um, a race between the, the the hardware guys to build quantum hardware, and this race has accelerated with an open end. And also, from a, again, from a business or from an academic point of view, this competition is good because competition leads, in the end, to, the, to, the, to, a, to a better solution uh, compared um, when there would only be one, one, one firm in the field who built the, um, the hardware. So we can hope that from this competition, at the end, we will get a really good scalable hardware for the quantum computing stuff. Also, on the algorithmic side, we see... Um, we see uh, um, progress. Again, John Breskill uh, announced again for four weeks ago, um, he and his collaborators found a kind of quantum advantage for a problem with relevance to chemistry and material science, science which is great because uh, before many of these quantum advantage algorithms and this quantum advantage um, calculations, they were basically useless for, for business. So they were, I mean, this boson sampling is nice, but you can't build a, build a machine or build a business out of boson sampling. But he here, John Breskill says he and his collaborators, he found an application with a relevance to chemistry and material science, and this would be useful, useful for the, for the industry, useful for the community, useful to apply quantum computing. And I think this is important, not only to have, to have, an, to have a theoretical, theoretical uh, advantage, but also a, a practical advantage. Another good news, also from the last week's um, here from the super productive Jens Eisert in Berlin, our colleague um, who developed um, an algorithm which promises theoretically a super polynomial quantum advantage for um, com combinatorial optimization problems. And 
combinatorical optimization problems is at the heart of many industry applications. Um, so this could be useful in the, in, the, in the future. This algorithm, however, is also, I mean, only feasible in a world with many, many, many error free qubits. So it's not a NISC algorithm, but it's an alg algorithm for the future. But so here we see the development of algorithms available when we reach from the hardware side this, this step to have really many, to have many qubits around to play with them and use with them. So at the end, Quo vadis, uh, my conclusion, um, the amount of hype is so damn high, is still damn high. Uh, we see man, much hype in the, in, in, in the field. Some people fear the quantum winter is coming. There is critis criticism, sensible criticism. Some, sometimes the quantum community shoots back and say, oh, don't criticize us, let us work. I think criticism, criticism is, is necessary. The challenge is necessary to improve. And my request is quite simple, fight the hype. There are so many millions around, so let's spend the millions on long-term oriented research. I think it doesn't matter if we reach this point of advantage next year or in five years, we will reach it, but we, you, but we need serious research to do this. And no matter how long it takes, that's the wish, that's the hope, that's the request which uh, with I would like to stop my presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Gerard. It was a really nice presentation and we are really happy that we arrived to the good news because we were kind of worried <laughs> on with the bad news. Yeah, okay. So now we are for, open for the question. If there is a question you can ask, you can raise your hand or you can write it in the Q&A box. So while everyone is looking for the Q&A box, I will start with the question I asked at the <laughs> end of my presentation. Uh, God, um, first of all, I really like your presentation um, as yeah, expectation management is super important and we need to fight the hype. I wouldn't say we need to fight it. We need a realistic view on the hype because the hype is important to drive the things further, but we need to provide especially the potential end users with a realistic view on the whole topic. So this is super important. This is why I really like your presentation about the bad and the good news. <clears throat> it's not everything good and not everything what is marketed uh, from the big companies, from other companies is really uh, true. Um, <clears throat> so we need to distinguish there. My question is, um, what do you see currently as the biggest challenge besides the high management? And what would you need in terms of um, yeah, driving the topic in general further. Mm, I, I, there are two points, maybe. I see, maybe just from my academic point of view, I see much skepticism about this field, even in, in, the, in, the, in academia, at the, the universities, um, in computer science, people are very reluctant and I wish they would be more open to this, to this field um, to, to say, okay, there's something around. We don't know at the moment how far it will go, but we should, we should deal with it and we, consider, we should consider it as, as a possibility. More openness. From different uh, from different people, and also I would wish that the the topic of quantum computing should leave the um, the physics department. I, I I can I see it in Germany a little bit that quantum computing is still a topic in physics, and it's it should be a topic also in computer science, also a kind in business, and this is um, this is not the case at the moment. And I'm uh, part of my mission is to to bring com quantum computings to these people outside physics. Physicists, of course, they know a lot about quantum computing, but you can use quantum computing. You can, you can uh, apply it even if you are not a physicist and you, don't, you are not so much in the details of, of, of quantum information. And I think this is necessary. More people should be involved in this, in this topic and should deal with this topic. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, good. Thank you again, Gerard. And uh, we can go on with our next speaker, Jonathan Burnett. He's from the Orange Quantum System, Oxford Quantum System. So you can share your screen. There we go. Helps if I unmute myself. 
Uh, okay. Uh, yes. So I'm uh, yeah Jonathan Burnett, uh, the technical director of hardware engineering at Oxford Quantum Circuits. Uh, I'd like to thank the organisers for the opportunity to um, yeah present here. So it's quite an exciting uh, you know sort of session to talk about what is the status quo and then get you know different heads together around actually all have a slightly different take on what that would look like. So for me, uh, we're going to be talking around status quo from the perspective of offering a service. And then in terms of offering that service around moving that into data centers, this links quite nicely to uh, Gerhard's last comments around getting uh, quantum out of the mind share only of a physics type background. So for me, I would re relate to that as being getting it out of the lab. Um, so with that, let's likewise do some uh, introduction material for OQC. So uh, as a company, OQC, uh, we founded in 2017, we spun out of the University of Oxford then with a Coexmon based IP. So that's what you can see on the right hand side. The Coexmon is a unit cell, so it's like an architecture for how we realize a superconducting qubit platform. Uh, with that, we have a very sort of extensible platform. Um, which then means we can sort of care about the scaling challenges at other parts of the system. Uh, we got our own uh, laboratory facilities in 2020, so not that long ago. And then we've been inside of co-location data centers since 2023 and also international uh, in Japan since 2023. As a company, we are uh, just over 100 people. And many of those are from a non-quantum background. So again, that kind of narrative of needing more than just a physics-based background to, to get involved in quantum and seeing it as a much wider uh, technical challenge in that regard. And then as a company, uh, what our mission is, is to put quantum in the hands of humanity and therefore enable humanity to solve some of the world's greatest challenges. In putting it literally in the hands of humanity, this for us means you have to provide a service, you have to provide access. So then that now means in terms of the, the many sort of you know puzzle pieces and that you need to put together as a jigsaw to realize a useful quantum computer, you've now got a lot of things leaning on what does that service look like and then the need for service maturity. For that, we led to uh, a very early decision, which was as a company to actually offer a service on a quantum computer. And for us, that was Lucy, and we've done that for over two years. And I'll get to that in a moment with a bit more detail. So... What does uh, OQC do? You might think that we build quantum computers, and in a sense, that is true. But again, building on that mission part, what we do, OQC provides QCAS. So we provide quantum computing as a service. There's then a very quick secondary point, which is on full stack systems that we indeed build. And then what does that look like in practice? Um, you sort of work your way up from the bottom to the top here. So that is doing the design, development, fabrication of the QPU chips themselves. It is working through the IO um, and cryogenic hardware uh, challenges that you need to then connectorize that. Uh, going into the room temperature ends, that is then um, high-speed digital electronics, um, like FPGA-based type control. Um, going into the software and back end of that, you've then got how you actually turn this not from being a quantum experiment, but actually into a computer, which is then via compilation layers. And then getting into these access points, you've now got what that looks like in terms of um, you know, scheduling, getting uh, sort of dynamic queues and things in place, and then likewise uh, networking as well. So at least someone needs to access this thing. In terms of sort of, I guess, phrasing that like the status quo, that is a case of saying currently, Quantum computing is in a world which is a cloud-based access model. So cloud-based access model means that you've got something where there's a laboratory environment, that laboratory environment contains a quantum computer. Uh, this quantum computer is then hooked up uh, you know, via some network to public cloud. And then it might be that some companies are offering a service from that direct, as in they're building their own um, sort of cloud platform. Or it might be you're using a available cloud platform, such as uh, AWS Brackets. So that leads to quantum compute as a service or QCAS, and that is the, the status quo for you know, the field at large. And in pictures, you can sort of see that to the right-hand side of, you know, there's a user in one location. They might be an office. They might be you know, working from home in a hybrid world. The cloud, we don't quite know where that is, as in, you know, it's a distributed um, entity in that regard. And then there's a lab which is containing this control server and your QPU, which is your quantum computer. So then the future directions away from that status quo, you've got this need to get out of the lab. And one of the reasons you need to do this is service maturity. 
but you also have it around where and how does classical compute fit in. So a very common uh, kind of thought piece that we found is that any real application of quantum computing will rely on a hybrid platform. Hybrid meaning you've got a classical compute like a HPC element. And so now when you look at this picture, you'd say, where does the HPC fit in? So the future directions is those two things. And those two things is really to do with how does quantum computing become part of modern digital infrastructure? So let's work through the first one of those. So um, offering the service, QCAS. Uh, so on the right-hand side, you've got OQC's Lucy. So this is an eight-qubit quantum computing platform. This has been running a service for over two years uh, via AWS Brackets. So we launched it back in February of 22. Um, that meant that the hardware has been frozen. So this picture was taken back then, and it very much looks exactly the same. And across that time, we overnight, we became an as-a-service company. Suddenly, we're caring about the SLAs and incident response and so on that's associated with this. Now, these are non-quantum problems. But if you're in you know, a very mature industry like finance or something, you're going to want to know that these things are in place so that you can find an end use here. And across those two years, we've had uh, a uptime of over 97%. So we're very pleased with that. And then likewise, a lot of uh, usage. Typically, we measure this as uh, tasks, but you can come up with other metrics. Coming back to those uh, hybrid challenges around where does your kind of classical element fit in? So you could say, well, you could put the classical element by the user, except now you're requiring every user to sit alongside their own HPC resource. So that's not particularly scalable. You could look at it as saying, maybe that sits in the cloud. There's naturally HPC resources available in the cloud. Um, however, if you do this, you're now going to get into data sovereignty type arguments. Do you know exactly where the HPC is compared to where uh, the servers which are giving you access are? Likewise, you're going to run into um, these kind of latency and queue dynamic things. So typically, any of these hybrid models, you're locking both resources which now means that you're caring about the time it takes for um, anything to be offloaded between the two. So you're now you're going to get into this um, you know, slight complications. What the ideal world here looks like is, can you just put the HPC and the quantum together? So can they co-locate in the same space? Because if they can do that, then modern digital infrastructure just starts to contain quantum computing, and this is far more seamless. So then in order to do that, you're now going to have some questions around well, can you bring quantum computing into a data center? There's many data centers in the world. So can you do that more than once? There are international. Can you do that there? And that really is just describing all the expectations of modern digital infrastructure, which is you can buy a server from any shop that, you know, or any place that you buy this, you can send it to somewhere else in the world and basically expect that it works. And everything I've described there isn't the status quo of quantum computing at the moment. So along that journey, uh, shortly after we had launched Lucy, OQC started to reach out to a number of uh, data center um, companies. So in this case, Equinix here. And the Equinix are uh, the world's biggest co-location data center provider. And it was around this idea of, can you put a quantum computer into it? So very much uh, exploring the possibilities. And naturally, I've already kind of shown a picture of one in there, so it's sort of been done. but. Uh, to walk you along the story a bit here, uh, what you're seeing is a empty data hall floor. And it's not quite empty because there's this thing in the middle of it. That thing here is the frame and the early installation work of the dilute refrigerator. So one of the pieces. And obviously you get a lot more built around that. So we'll show you a different example. So this is now uh, alongside Evoke 6 Terra or now Center Square as they've just been uh, rebranded to. Um, so this is a facility in London. What you've got here on the left-hand side are multiple quantum computers in the kind of operating state, as in it's closed, um, and therefore the system to cold service is running. In the middle, you can see an example of uh, what this looks like when it's open. And on the right-hand side, you can see these um, server cabinets, which are then containing the networking, uh, HPC, and uh, control electronics. So we did this work uh, alongside, um, let's say, Evoke 6 Terra. At the time, uh, this is the first time that a quantum computer had gone into a co-location data center. So then this was also something that got awarded uh, Data Center Dynamics um, European Data Center Project of the Year Award, uh, which obviously we're incredibly pleased that we've got this out of the lab. We've got systems and services which are now running not from a um, laboratory environment anymore. 
The systems that we have, this is now Toshiko, so this is OQC's next-gen system. So it's no longer Lucy. So Lucy was the old 8-qubit uh, quantum computing platform that did run from a laboratory environment. We've now uh, upgraded the uh, qubit counts from 8 to 32. We've likewise improved coherence and 2Q gate fidelities, and this is all in multiple instances. So uh, these are like medians across uh, systems in Spain, UK, and Japan. And because you're now inside of a data center, you also get a new access model, which is that you can have users that co-locate with the quantum computer. So now this means that you can actually access a quantum computer without using public internet. So I think that's for me is a, a really kind of exciting part around being uh, a part of modern digital infrastructure. Uh, what it also lets us do is take that HPC point. So this was very much one of the earlier motivations. And now that you're inside of a data center, you're naturally able to accommodate the uh, heat loads of HPC. This means that you can truly co-locate. And when I say that, I mean, there's a picture on the right-hand side. You've got a cabinet, which is containing servers. The servers are containing, uh, I've got work here with NVIDIA Gracehoppers or with uh, Fujitsu A64FXs. And these are literally the next cabinet along from the control. So this is as close as you can get. It is absolutely um, the lowest latency that you could have. And it means that from a system design perspective, you're starting to now say, this is how a future hybrid quantum computing and HPC platform looks and comes together. And on this, we work um, alongside uh, Sixtero and their AI, uh, AI and Quantum Center of Excellence. And likewise, um, at Seska, so this is a supercompute center in Santiago, uh, North Spain, which is the Fujitsu Quantum Center, around this technical frontier, which is how you bring, um, let's say, HPC and quantum together. In order to support that, uh, what we as OQC have done is that we've opened up uh, our compilation. So this is CAT for us, so the quantum assembly tool chain. Um, we've opened this up. It's now gone open source, and that is to foster more collaboration around this technical frontier. And then to move us towards uh, a kind of outro and a wrap up. So we we'll walked through an idea of what's the status quo in quantum computing and that this is a cloud-based access model. And that in most cases, this comes from a laboratory environment. Going, you know, pushing that status quo. So showing recent work, which has come from OQC, which is around getting out of the lab. And then this is to include more technical backgrounds, which are not just from a physics mindset and get us into modern digital infrastructure. So into data center locations and multiple center locations at that. Uh, that we've also done this while upgrading our quantum computing system. So going from an eight qubit platform to a 32 qubit platform while also improving uh, coherence and 2Q um, fidelity. That system, Toshiko, that's in private preview as we speak and general availability is coming very, very soon. And I should take a moment to plug uh, recruitment and that recruitment is in no way limited to quantum only roles. There are many non-quantum roles so if any of this stuff has been of interest, please do get in touch. And of course, it then helps if we give some contact details. So there they are, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Jonathan, for this presentation. We really enjoyed it. And, and now we are open to questions. Uh, for our dear listeners, you can write your question in the Q&A box. It's on the low bar of your Zoom application near to the chat button. So you can write your questions there. We either answer that or read it out loud. So now we are open to it if there is any question. I can what? answer uh, Johan's uh, yeah, biggest challenge question if needed. Yeah, please. <laughs> Uh, so, so for me, the, the biggest challenge is uh, supply chain. So as, if you look at what affects uh, the timelines of most of this technical work, uh, the biggest contributor to timeline is supply chain and build, and in essence, leveling up that whole ecosystem. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, supply chain, I think, is, is super crucial. Um, what do you think um, how the audience and all the community uh, can, can help you with this? Uh, I think the key thing is is just us getting better at talking. So unfortunately, um, academic conferences, uh, you know, where you get the exhibition halls and so on, um, 
yeah, these are normally great show pieces, but they don't necessarily get the engagement that they should get. And it's only by talking that we can actually walk through what are our challenges, you know, give things like forecasts and then help one another, you know, level that up in the future. Um, and then I have to say as much as supply chain has been a pain, uh, any time that I've got involved talking with entities on that, it's amazing the work that other companies can do. Yep, collaboration is key, I would say. <laughs> Thank you very much. Then up to we have uh, other questions. Yeah. yeah, we have a question from Raba Hanfung from TNO. He has, a, he has Thank you, Jonathan, for the interesting presentation. And he's also wondering about the way you deal with syncation, if I'm reading correctly, and export control applied to the quantum technology. Uh, okay, so, so export control Thanks, and yeah. shipping uh, entities, like the parts of kit worldwide. Um, indeed, this is uh, this relates to the supply chain problem. So uh, first thing is to, to check where you're sourcing components from, which is very much supply chain. Um, then you do have lots of uh, export control lists around potential due use and so on of items. Uh, fortunately, there are very mature frameworks for this in a general sense. Um, but many countries, UK being one of them, uh, is starting to now bring in uh, quantum-specific um, you know, kind of export controls. So this is also one of those, um, technically, that's a frontier within the whole community. And then in order to tackle that, we need to collaborate, engage with UK, um, you know, governments um, around what, what concerns should be and what we should be doing about it. Sure, yeah. Thank you again. And there is another question on a rough overview on the elements of supply chain. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're going deeper on this. Um, <laughs> I guess, uh, yeah, so, so if I go back um, yeah, to one of these pictures, so the, the total bill of materials for everything you'll see here is a couple of hundred lines. So that's not, um, yeah, that's not that's not crazily large. I mean, if you you consider like the the most complicated thing the humanity's ever made, uh, which is probably like the the deep UV, um, you know, lithography tooling, um, as an example, where that's more like a hundred thousand lines. So it's a lot less than that. Um, but what you have got is a load of components that generally. Um, yeah, what is it the quantum community's done as a whole is we've leveraged the ability of the test and measurement community. So that's true whether you're looking at laser-based or RF and microwave-based control techniques. And then consequently, it's true, therefore, if you're looking at uh, things like optical um, you know, tables, vacuum chambers, or cryogenics, so all of the, the related peripherals, all of those things um, are mature but were designed for laboratory environments. And they were also designed with physicists in mind which means that they were subject to um, things like the, the the grant process. So in other words, a company gets a speculative request for an order that may never materialize. Suddenly, you're in a world where you've got lots of startups, lots of you know, money floating around, as, as Gerhard had shown. Um, and in that world, you're now going to these same companies and saying, oh, that thing that we speculatively wanted one of a year or two ago, we now want 10 of or we now want a number much larger than that. And suddenly they don't have the capacity to work at that supply and they can level themselves up for it. But then if you don't go back to them in a future year and repeat that order, suddenly that company may not be able to sustain itself indefinitely. So there's a definitely a duty of care here around the supply chain management. I see. Thank you so much. And uh, and this, we have Anna Jawaka. She has commented on a Spectrum project. So for this, I will give her the speak chance. So maybe she can talk about it. If she has any notion about it, she can share it with us. Anna, we are here. Well, let's kind of pity, although your mic are open, but we cannot hear you. Yeah, okay. So Anna said that there is a problem with the mic and she will write it here. And uh, Jonathan, I guess we have to move on with our next speakers. But when once we get the question, we will write, send it to you. <laughs> 
So no thank you, Anna, and thank you, John, Jonathan, for the nice presentation and answering the questions. So I uh, will uh, give the scene to our next speaker, which is the uh, Christian Benio from the Pascal. Christian, now you can share your screen and we are all here to hear you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah. Let me share my screen. Uh... Let me know if you can see it correctly. Yes, we can. Perfect. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and the occasion. Uh, my name is Christian Benio. I'm a technical business developer and a quantum solutions expert uh, here at Pascal. And so for today's talk, I brought a couple of key messages, uh, some of them uh, uh, have already been shared with you by previous speakers uh, and some of them not yet. Uh, so uh, for today, I'm going to focus on, I would say, four uh, key points, uh, uh, key uh, important takeaway messages. Uh, the first one being the potential synergy between quantum computers and uh, AI or machine learning paradigms uh, in general. So here I'm really using the phrase synergies in the sense that it's a mutual interaction. Uh, so AI can help boost uh, uh, quantum computing. Uh, this is something that we have seen uh, for the emulation side as well as uh, for certain uh, algorithmic developments, but also quantum can help out with certain machine learning techniques. Uh, the second message, and for this I've cited uh, value creation estimate from uh, Boston Consulting Group, uh, uh, which uh, um, emphasizes a quite a large potential market uh, by 2035. So here the important part is the date actually, not, not really the amount, uh, but the date. So that they are really predicting for the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, uh, the initial report was in 2021, so they were doing a 15-year prediction. So it's more a long-term value creation, uh, and so it's a long-term development uh, that you have to keep in mind. Uh, this does not exclude a certain potential, uh, uh, I would say, uh, shortcuts or quicker wins. I wouldn't call them quick wins, but as we will see, certain technologies have an advantage to reaching uh, what certain refer to as quantum utility, others talk about quantum gain or even quantum advantage. Uh, the third message, and this is a key one that hasn't really been mentioned, is the energy footprint. Uh, so anything related to energy consumption, the carbon footprint uh, related to quantum computing as a whole, the technologies, so quantum computers uh, in particular, the use case uh, in a more uh, full life cycle analysis. Uh, so this is a very important objective, uh, especially because quantum computing today uh, is viewed as part of the HPC, so high performance computing uh, value chain, uh, which is very, very energy war. So the energy consumption there is enormous. So data centers, supercomputers are consuming way too much energy. So there are global effort, efforts that have been launched to reduce uh, uh, this uh, the consumption. And there are potential tracks in which quantum computers can help out in various ways. So, and finally, a message that has already been highlighted is about the exploration. And I'm going to discuss a little bit more on this topic, especially on use cases to exploration, because uh, it's not just a question of what kind of algorithm works, but uh, trying to find the right use case for that algorithm uh, that can have some short-term or maybe a more longer-term impact uh, on the industry. With that said, uh, uh, let me start with a couple of words uh, about Pascal. So Pascal has been founded in 2019, so we are today almost five years old. Uh, um, France headquartered quantum computing scale up uh, that's present globally. So in the picture, you can see on the left our CEO and co-founder, George Olivier Raymond. Uh, in the middle, Professor Alan Espe, who has obtained the Physics Nobel Prize in 2022. Uh, 
uh, based on 40 years of research uh, in, in the neutral atoms technology. So currently we are more than 250 uh, all across the world, as I mentioned, uh, most of us are in Fr uh, France or in the Netherlands, uh, but we are present in North America, in the Middle East and uh, Far Eastern Asia Pacific region as well. Uh, and uh, to dig a bit deeper into it, I wanted to highlight uh, our recently released roadmap. Uh, so this is uh, Pascal's current five-year roadmap that we have published uh, last month. Uh, so it's one of the more recent ones uh, compared to uh, other technology providers uh, that have released similar news either end of last year or beginning of this year. And uh, there are a couple of key takeaway messages uh, in it. Uh, I won't go into too much detail explaining all the technical elements uh, for that. Uh, we have released uh, a recorded webinar uh, uh, beginning of last month, uh, and you ha all have uh, free access to the recording. So those of you who are interested, uh, please uh, do contact me and I can send you over the recording for more information. What I wanted to highlight here, and this is something that uh, is represented in many uh, technology providers' roadmaps, is the separation between uh, a more innovation research and development track. Uh, here it is called a technology track, uh, and uh, another track uh, uh, corresponding to more product, uh, so end user focused um, developments. Uh, so there is a uh, a sort of uh, misalignment between these two because uh, as most uh, uh, quantum hardware providers, uh, uh, a significant part of our activity is based on research and development, uh, trying to push for that next generation machine that achieves uh, higher fidelities, uh, more qubit counts, uh, up, um, brings us one step closer to quantum error correction or fault tolerant quantum computing paradigms uh, or any other uh, similar tracks. Uh, so this is something that's typically available on the research track. Uh, and uh, these machines are developed in-house uh, and uh, not released yet uh, for the actual production. So hence uh, the reason why it is uh, a bit uh, misaligned. Uh, on the product side, uh, a couple of key messages uh, that's important to highlight is, uh, first of all, uh, as you may have noticed, uh, uh, in the current representative of the generations of uh, Pascal devices, uh, uh, we are uh, pushing for gate equivalence. Uh, uh, this is because uh, at heart, uh, a neutral atoms technology, especially our technology, is what we call an analog quantum computer. Uh, uh, analog meaning that we are operating uh, with uh, continuous in time signals instead of quantum logic gates, uh, which brings about different potential applications and different potential advantages uh, compared to a digital quantum logic gate based setting. Nevertheless, uh, as with all the different technologies, the holy grail is achieving a full fault tolerance, so error corrected uh, digital, so quantum logic gate-based setting, uh, which is uh, predicted for our technology in the next couple of years. Uh, as it has been mentioned, uh, QRS roadmap uh, is projecting this uh, for the end of, for the beginning of 2027. Uh, our projection is a bit more consolidated for 2028 instead, uh, but this is something that's uh, coming and the neutral atoms technology has mm, picked up a lot of track uh, since uh, the past couple of months with various publications on the potential of how one can realize a more digital quantum logic gate-based setting in the technology. The final message I wanted to highlight with this roadmap is uh, related to the community aspect. Uh, so everything related to uh, open sourcing and platform development for learning, uh, interacting, and collaborating. Uh, so this is a track that has been uh, uh, dominated so far by uh, IBM's famous Qiskit environment. Uh, they were one of the first uh, who start this open source, largely accessible, uh, very detailed uh, notebook sessions uh, and uh, very nice documentations. And the community they created around it, uh, uh, supported by many diverse hackathons. Uh, uh, and getting included into various curriculum as well for training materials. Uh, uh, current statistics show that uh, those who are learning uh, anything related to quantum computing uh, 
between 85 to 90% of these users get acquainted with Qiskit, so IBM's development environment uh, first uh, or uh, exclusively, uh, which is a good thing because they have a large amount of open source resources at their disposal. However, uh, IBM's architecture and uh, superconducting devices have their natural drawbacks as well. Uh, and it is important to uh, increase awareness that other uh, software tools, uh, other open source platforms and solutions exist as well, uh, and tailored to different types of hardware technologies. Uh, and with these different technologies uh, come different types of uh, potential use cases and applications. Uh, another thing I wanted to highlight and I haven't really mentioned beforehand is the hybridization track. Uh, uh, so this is something that's very, very hard to measure currently, uh, especially when one starts to talk about quantum advantage, uh, hybrid, so uh, quantum classical algorithms uh, are typically very hard uh, to uh, quantify from a purely mathematical complexity theory point of view. Uh, in most cases, people uh, uh, suggest uh, or uh, theorize that it cannot actually lead to a uh, proper theoretical quantum advantage. Uh, however, it is very much a NISC, so noise intermediate scale quantum uh, compatible solution. Uh, and this is the track that we are observing, uh, especially here in Europe, uh, where the HPC QS, so, so the High Performance Computing Quantum Simulator Hybrid Initiative, uh, a European initiative is uh, facilitating the inclusion of various different quantum computers in existing uh, HPC and supercomputing environments uh, in order to test and experiment on the integration in order to give access to a large variety of different devices to the various users, be it research labs and users or students. Uh, and first and foremost, to, to facilitate the, our Andreas understanding of these hybrid solutions as well. Uh, with that said, uh, one of my main messages I wanted to highlight for today is uh, the energy efficiency. Uh, the potential energy efficiency of quantum computing technologies. Uh, so this is not something that's inherent for all the different types of quantum computers. Uh, it is, this is more prevalent for neutral atoms, uh, trapped ions, and photonic technologies uh, that do not work with active uh, liquid cryogenics all the time. Uh, a common mistake that people make when they talk about these technologies is that they say that it is running on room temperature, which is factually incorrect. Uh, they are not running on room temperature. However, not all of their components, not all of the device uh, requires active cooling. Uh, uh, depending on the technology, different other uh, techniques are used uh, to provide the necessary low temperature regime uh, for an optimal way of functioning. In the case of neutral atoms devices, uh, uh, the system itself is operating inside a vacuum chamber uh, in which we are using what we call magneto-optical cryogenics. Uh, so magnetic fields uh, and lasers, so optical devices uh, to trap uh, and manipulate uh, atoms uh, within the vacuum. And it is a consequence of thermodynamics laws that the temperature is cold because Within the vacuum, only our atoms are present, and these atoms are trapped, so they cannot physically move. Uh, however, it's not just related to the actual technology that uh, power consumption can be lower, uh, because power consumption is inherently related to the cooling, uh, to the keeping the temperature lower. Uh, so not requiring liquid cryogenics can bring about a huge change, uh, a game changer, I would say, uh, that can be an important indicator uh, to evaluate use cases. Uh, so it's not necessarily just about uh, um, a gain in speed, so accelerating uh, or uh, gaining precision. It's all, all also about uh, how much energy we are consuming in solving the solution. How frequently do we have to deploy the, this solution? How energy efficient the, the solution lifecycle is? Uh, this requires not only resources, uh, 
that are energy efficient, uh, but use cases uh, that promote this energy efficiency. And in, with this regard, there is a high poten potential for quantum computers, especially in the optimization tracts. Uh, uh, there are a lot of recent investigations uh, that have been launched uh, on trying to identify uh, uh, use cases that are well positioned with, for instance, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, so bringing about a better future, a more energy efficient future, uh, all the way relying on potentially more uh, uh, energy efficient uh, computational resources. Uh. And uh, with this, uh, I think I will start uh, uh, stop here for now. Uh, if you have any uh, questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, Thank you so much, Christian. It was a really interesting and eye-catching presentation. Well, as the same manner for all presentation, we are now open to questions. You can either write it in chat or request for opening a mic, so we will let you in. And ask I have a question. question for you, Christian. So, um, <clears throat> I totally agree uh, that energy consumption also is a super important thing. And we are currently developing together with Dean and Fauna for Focus and the larger consortium, um, Dean spec on uh, the KPIs, on standardized KPIs for quantum computing benchmarking. And energy is definitely one of the main topics. Um, but this is not part of my question. My question is uh, from the uh, live chat um, at YouTube. Um, so there is a question about the pricing. So not about the number of the qubits, but the pricing. Um, so if you want, or if someone want to um, have a project and uh, use a quantum computer for this project, um, how can they get the pricing from you? So I know that, for example, for very simple projects, just to start learning, you can use, of course, Qiskit, you can use um, uh, simulators that are freely available. There is a quantum inspire freely available <clears throat> with, I think, two and five qubits at the moment. Um, I know that if you have enough money, you can also uh, give it to IBM and you are then in the range of 10 to 100 thousands of euros, depending on what you want to do. How is it with Pascal? Yeah, so uh, that's definitely one of the key parts of, of the community aspect. I wanted to highlight that Qiskit is not the only solution. Uh, so uh, to give a Pascal related example, we have developed full uh, two uh, open source uh, software stacks, uh, Pulsar and Cadence, uh, that have uh, uh, very decent uh, online documentation with exercises and notebooks around it. Uh, and later this year, uh, we are going to release uh, our own uh, community platform, which is called Quantum Discovery. Uh, some of you might have had a chance to use it uh, as testers uh, beforehand, uh, but later this year, it will be available for the large community, and it is going to be a cloud-based uh, learning and experimentation tool that gives you uh, access to our emulators uh, and our dedicated uh, development resources uh, to learn more about quantum computing in general, in particular analog quantum computing, this being in a minority, and understand better how neutral atoms quantum computing works. Uh, so, and we are not the only ones uh, who are promoting uh, more open source and largely accessible tool sets. Uh, so it is becoming increasingly important, uh, especially because quantum computing currently starts to get integrated into trainings. Uh, so there are more and more master's programs that are dedicated to quantum computing, which is sort of a hybrid between physics, mathematics, and uh, computer science. Uh, and uh, these training, uh, these uh, courses need, of course, training material and resources. Uh, and for that, uh, since I'm based in France, I'm mostly familiar with the French and sometimes the European system, but the French government uh, is offering help uh, for uh, learning institutes and research labs in getting access uh, to a large variety of uh, quantum computational resources. And this is part of the tract of the HPC QS project uh, that's mentioned uh, down in the bottom. So if you're interested in more for European solutions, uh, the HPC QS platform offers a similar uh, access uh, to various quantum computing uh, resources uh, within uh, existing European supercomputers. Uh, uh, there are currently partnered with, I think, nine sites across Europe uh, 
providing access to various different systems, uh, either through partnership uh, for free or for nominal price, depending on uh, uh, what subsidiaries are available. So it's definitely going the right direction. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, I wouldn't say that you have you can have too much access for free, but it's getting, it's really going the right way. But yeah, the, the European Commission also announced this um, quantum excellence centers call, and I think potential end users from industry and academia will be also able to get access um, through this uh, excellence centers then. Um, that we will hopefully see uh, next year, I think, at the beginning of next year. Um, Jonathan, just a question also for you. How is it about the pricing? Jonathan, are you still with us? Sorry, struggling with the uh, mute button. Uh, so on, on AWS Bracket, uh, pricing, I believe, is listed there when you make an account. Um, so it's sort of semi-public. Um, and then otherwise, uh, contacting OQC Direct and then sort of depends on the, the nature of the product, um, like what's been uh, sought. Okay, so it's available at Amazon and uh, you can find all the prices there, right? That seems to be the case. Sounds so, great. <clears throat> yeah, Christian, uh, there's another question from Marco for you. He's asking, uh, how is Pascal different from its competitors in terms of application or what can neutral atoms give that other systems can't? So uh, I would put the main differentiator in terms of applications uh, is the fact that we are operating with uh, atomic registers, which are um, by default, at least, two-dimensional structures. Uh, uh, and in particular, they are very well adapted to any kind of uh, graph, so network-based methods, uh, uh, which are typically present in most combinatorial optimization problems and a uh, large subset of machine learning uh, problems as well. Uh, so any kind of graph or network-based problem formulation has a more native adaptation on a neutral atoms system. Uh, compared to other types of uh, quantum technologies. Uh, other than that, uh, neutral atoms, it's not the only one, but because uh, trapped ions uh, and, and uh, some specific horrific variants of superconducting uh, technologies are very adept at uh, analog quantum computing, uh, which has been identified as uh, one of the key elements for reaching early quant scientific quantum advantage in terms of simulations. Uh, so simulating many body physics problems or quantum, uh, quantum systems uh, and quantum phenomena uh, is a key, I would say, research application. So there hasn't really been too many actual industrial use cases identified, uh, but in terms of uh, physical research and increasing our understanding, they are definitely the best candidates uh, to be exploited. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, with this, we can go on with our speakers. The next speaker will be Carl Dukats from the Accenture company. Carl, we are happy to have you here. You can start sharing your screen and let us join from your presentation. All right. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm Carl Duquette. I lead the next generation compute team here at Accenture, which includes both quantum computing and quantum security research and development. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Accenture, Accenture is a global professional services and system integration company with over 700,000 people around the globe. Uh, we've been involved in the quantum computing ecosystem for over a decade now, or almost a decade now. And we've focused on identifying use cases and then using the quantum computers available today to validate and benchmark their viability and runtimes on real world applications. And in doing this work, we've identified the need for better projections for how we can speak to the value of quantum and when it will be realized. And so I'm gonna share a bit about that today. I 
would be remiss if I didn't mention some of the collaborators on this work, uh, some of the folks from MIT, University of Albany, and also within Accenture. So Neil, Sukwong, and Prashant have put forth a tremendous effort, uh, along with many others, to help ideate and refine this framework that I'm going to share uh, throughout several years now. So why are we interested in, in quantum computing? At a use case level, you often hear people talking about medicines, uh, designing new medicines, creating new medicines, or designing better products, optimizing businesses um, in finance or energy, and ultimately creating advantages for these different industries. Uh, while these goals make practical sense, uh, for me and for many others, when we look at quantum computing as a technology, uh, we're looking for opportunities that greater uh, that benefits IoT at a greater level. And so some of the implications to improve compute uh, in the ways that quantum computing can provide advantage across optimization, machine learning, and, and simulation can be mapped to some of the grander challenges and grander goals, such as the UN's uh, sustainability development goals, such as uh, climate change, good health, uh, well-being, clean water, no poverty. But before we can get here, quantum computers need to be able to uh, have the opportunity to provide the powerful advantages in order to impact these grand challenges. And understanding how we get to this level of, of engagement is incredibly important. So understanding where quantum computing will provide its improvements is important because quantum computing has been and is often heralded as, as the next generation of computing. So it um, provides promising successor to traditional computing in that uh, as we monitor the progression and slowing down of Moore's law, we are actively seeking alternatives. But the reality is more complicated. In general, quantum computers are slower than traditional ones, thus all being equal, less capable. Luckily for us, all is not equal, and quantum computers themselves offer some amazing algorithms that classical computers can't run today. This is because quantum computers can represent large amounts of information in a dense space called su a superposition, a feature that classical computers don't have. And this allows us to represent information in ways that um, uh, quantum computers can do more computation on individual bits than just what uh, classical computers can do themselves. When advantage is, uh, or when these algorithms unlock um, this type of improvement or advantage, then um, we'll be more interested in, in using them at scale. And that's what some of this research is about. But if quantum computers don't have access to these better algorithms, then classical computers can easily outpace them. And this is kind of the, the world that we live in today is this outpacing by classical computers over and over again. And so where will quantum computers be able to provide this advantage or quantum advantage um, the term as it's defined today is really a blanket term for any uh, any place that a class, uh, quantum computer can provide advantage over any classical computer. But as we dive into it more, I don't think it particularly describes the nuances that we need to understand for these near-term applications where we're making decisions um, that uh, where problems exist that both quantum and classical computers can solve today. And so this is where we start to explore quantum economic advantage, which is the, uh, the comparison of the computational and uh, complexity of individual problems more specifically. So in, in simple terms, there are two things that we look at in terms of quantum economic advantage. The first is feasibility. Is a quantum computer powerful enough to solve a problem? Um, for a quantum computer, it's important not only that there's enough qubits to solve the problem, but the qubits can maintain their state of entanglement and um, the delicate quantum properties that allow the computers to do the calculations, um, which are not um, possible with classical ones. Quantum feasibility is achieved when a quantum computer running codes to minimize the accumulation of these errors is uh, then viable for it to solve a given set of problems. And even once the problem, uh, the quantum computer is able to solve the problem, it's not always obvious that you would use a quantum computer to solve that problem because we need to determine if the classical speed advantage is less than the shorter time to solve offered by a quantum device. 
The second feature that we're looking for is the algorithmic advantage. So this is the benefit that a quantum algorithm must be sufficiently larger than the speed of a comparable quantum uh, classical device. Uh, the quantum computers are much slower than classical devices today. That That's the reality. If we take a, a quantum computer and do one calculation step, uh, a classical computer can do roughly a million calculation steps in the same amount of time. And so when we're faced with such a dramatic speed disadvantage, it, one might imagine that quantum computers would lose any race, but that, that's simply not the case. Uh, with the shortened, um, with the ability to to have these algorithmic shortcuts and better algorithms, it, the, dif the difference in, in capability is significantly consequential. And the abilities for quantum computers uh, or quantum computers can win out in, in certain scenarios. We liken this to taking the route all the way around South America to get from uh, one location on the globe to the other versus using the, the ability to use the Panama Canal to, to ship goods that way. Um, significant speed up. So when we combine these two factors, uh, we, we create a wedge chart that denotes the area where quantum economic advantage can occur. And so both a problem that is viable solving and a faster solution from a quantum computer. Right now, we know um, a limited number of problems that, that have these shortcuts uh, but one, for instance, is factoring, factoring cryptography. So factoring a 248-bit key classically would take approximately 1,116 or 1,016 CPU years. And so this is equivalent to running millions of computers for the age of the universe, just to, just to factor one number. In contrast, Shor's algorithm, should we have a, a sufficiently sized device, could the theoretically run in days. And so factoring there's a clear net algorithmic advantage for this type of problem. But now the challenge we face is feasibility. So digging in a little deeper, how do we calculate these activities and when can we derive advantage? Well, the first thing we need to look at is, is pretty straightforward. It's the roadmaps, it's the trends, it's um, when quantum computers will have enough qubits at enough fidelity in order to uh, run the operations that we need for these particular algorithms. And so we can take points on published um, metrics and curves from different devices and then derive either linearly or exponentially what the machine sizes uh, are, are forecasted to grow to in the future. And that gives us uh, the first data point that we need to start to calculate some of these advantages. The next thing is the physical to logical qubit conversion. Um, for, for most calculations, physical qubits uh, can't be used as is because quantum uh, computers accumulate errors too quickly, thus the results vary in ways that can be wrong. And so to account for these errors, we need to uh, develop correcting codes. And there are many of these that exist today, um, but uh, until recently, the most viable ones were of higher, very high ratios. So a thousand qubits, uh, physical qubits to one logical qubit. And um, this uh, extends the timeline for viability of many quantum devices and, and quantum computations. However, more recently, um, we are seeing now error correcting methods and devices, or methods and codes that uh, reduce this to uh, a ratio down to um, one to 100 or even uh, one to maybe a couple dozen. And this announcement changes the, these announcements, if if can be uh, manifested in, in the timelines appropriately, change how we will look at when quantum computers can provide economic advantage um, in a significant way. The speed difference. So this is something that you know, I mentioned a couple times already, where it, it is a drastic speed difference in the number of calculations that a classical computer can can achieve in the same time that a quantum computer runs. And so um, when comparing this or calculating this, we look at many different factors. The, the gate delay of a quantum device and how long it takes to run uh, or to do those um, to do those gate transformations versus the clock speed or the cycles of a classical computer uh, give us a basis for how to calculate this. And considering that 
uh, classical computers are are on average um, 2,500 times faster in these individual uh, gate cycles because of the, the speed is a big deal. And so um, we also have to consider other things for quantum computers. And it's not just about the number of it, it takes uh, time it takes to do a single gate transformation, but because they're doing error correction and have other factors that are built into their uh, runtime uh, in order to achieve the same amount of work as a classical computer, uh, we have to factor that in, in in various weights. And then in addition to this, there's also the, the cost analysis that goes on here. So, um, yeah, there, there's cloud style plans to to use some of the quantum computers for maybe um, you know a dollar per second, but uh, if you contrast that to the amount of compute that you can get for a dollar per second in cloud service providers offering classical compute, you realize that uh, you're getting um, very uh, you know almost a hundred and six classical flops. Um, compared to uh, some of the singular gate operations on a quantum computer. And so this cost discrepancy is also a big factor that we that we have to consider. And then, yeah, and I mentioned the overhead for gate operations such as error correction. So all of these come into determining the speed difference. It's the, the speed, the overhead, and then also the algorithmic constant. So this is the, the time it takes to run the algorithm itself. When we look at algorithms, um, there are several examples of algorithms that we know provide a quantum speed up. So some um, such as the Deutsche Zosa, um, Deutsche Zosa in, in 1992 was one of the first algorithms that provided a, a um, the ability to look at at speed up and and then we moved on to things that could allow us to do unstructured search and discrete Fourier transforms and and other mechanisms as well. Um, what these come down to is the uh, class of complex the complexity class that the algorithm falls into. So Shor's algorithm itself runs in polynomial time, uh, but as we talked about earlier, there's an exponential speed up for doing it uh, classically or an exponential uh, penalty for for the classical um, sol solution. We see other things like Grover's algorithm that um, runs in uh, uh, that uh, requires a, a minimum problem size of of um, c uh, c squared, and um, there are other Fourier transforms that are of log n that. Um, again, require and uh, that would provide a, a speed up um, over the exponential fast Fourier transform that runs classically. Uh, HHL is another algorithm that provides speed up in a sparse linear system, and um, we can um, we can calculate again the effectiveness of that too. The ultimate thing that we're looking at here is uh, when we compare our current algorithms versus our classical algorithms, which ones, which algorithms have a complexity that's worthwhile exploring in um, a quantum paradigm that gives us enough advantage, soon enough that we would look at it in more of the near term. And so I think what we're, what we're looking at next is the ability to Put all of these uh, all these factors together into a calculator and understand where the timelines show us uh, where they lead, and and this is ultimately circles back to how much uh, investment is going into the ecosystem, how much more can go in to speed up some of the timelines for um, for problems that uh, we're able to evaluate effectively and show uh, a sooner or uh, a quicker relevant advantage than uh, some of the ones that uh, will take longer because the algorithm complexity is um, is not advantageous for the quantum devices in the near term. And so you can see here just uh, by changing the error correcting code 
uh, combination from 1000 to uh, 100 by changing that factor in something like integer factorization on, on some of the most modern hardware, you see an increase of three years and time to make this uh, system viable. And those can be big dramatic speed ups. And all of these uh, dials and features allow for this type of exploration and discovery within uh, the framework. And so what's next for us is we're working on a tool that can make these calculations more um, accessible to uh, folks rather than be buried in some uh, research papers and publications and allow people to manipulate the timelines as they see fit and input their, their hardware and um, uh, methods in order to draw their own conclusions. Uh, additionally, we're trying to map this to very specific industry problems. Um, right now we're focusing on chemistry, but we have other problems in mind where uh, calculating not just the speed up or advantage of a quantum device and the timeline that it can be achieved, but also the economic advantage of having better methods within an industry. Um, and this will then allow us to uh, once we've done enough of these, extrapolate some of the larger things like the strategic development goals and the impact that, that they will provide. Um, and so I guess to answer a couple of the questions, you know, what's the biggest challenge uh, in the industry today? I would say in the context of this research, the it's incredibly, uh, um, the challenge has been that we're incredibly effective at uh, using and advancing our, our classical computers alongside with our quantum computers. And the, that efficiency will continue to push quantum economic advantage further out. Um, however, there have been um, large decisions that uh, impact this industry as well, such as the, um, the, uh, the, the, upgrade to post-quantum cryptography. So the world has essentially decided that we are we are doing this, we're adding post-quantum post cryptographic algorithms to, to all of our systems. And um, the, the risk is high enough that we will at one day invent quantum computers of sufficient size and scale that the cryptography of the internet will be threatened. And so, uh, you know, bear in mind that the costs of doing that, the costs associated with changing uh, all of our, our devices today, and think, um, I think that if we're willing to bear that cost, then there are definitely hope for quantum advantages in other areas. And uh, we should definitely continue to strive to, to drive that forward. So I think there's a big challenge in the industry with classical, but I, I think that in some sense, the world has, has already overcome the, the belief that um, classical will be our only solution in the future. And then as far as what people in the audience can, can do to help grow this, I think uh, this relies on a lot of usage of the system and of benchmarks, and I hope that people will continue to explore and experiment with the devices, and uh, this type of analysis can only be done when we have uh, reliable data that is contributed to, to open benchmarks that, that will uh, help us do these calculations. So I'd encourage, poke, in addition to that, I'd encourage folks to focus on the algorithm development. It's clearly the place where... Um, all things being equal, quantum computers will provide the most advantages. And so we hope that there'll be big steps forward in algorithms and newer algorithms in error correcting codes or in, in different types of algorithms in general. Uh, so with that I'll pause. Thanks. Okay. So thank you so much, Cole, for the presentation and the talk. We are now open to the questions. You can write your question in the Q&A box and raise your hand so we can unmute you, you can ask. So there is one question uh, from Anuj uh, calling your presentation very insightful and he's asking, will this calculator be updated continuously? Yes, so the the um, we, we haven't quite decided yet, but the objective is to make this uh, calculation and tool available to to all folks. Uh, there's been a paper paper that's published that describes all the methods already, and it's available if you want to you know pull the data and run the calculations on your own. But we're hoping to include um, different hardware vendors, uh, as many different algorithms and the complexities that we can, and then also add on to it in the future with um, some of the more insightful. And, and detailed analysis of different industries. So, yes. Okay, so thank you so much.
Michael. Thank you again for the presentation and Thank you. talk. So we'll now go on with our next speaker, Florentine Raita from the Fraunhofer IAF. Florentine, you can now share your screen and start your talk. Okay. Which screen do you actually see? Do you see the presenter's view? Yep. No, the Is this the right PowerPoint. one? PowerPoint. You see the right one, no? Or? No, it's the PowerPoint application, not okay, the good. presentation me, mode. Yes, precisely. So you would want to see this, right? Sorry, no, I only see the, I only see, okay. There's no good. change. <laughs> okay, good. Then let me unshare and share again, just one moment. Um, is it, give me a second, this one should be the right one. That's the yes, actual presentation, right? Okay. Yes, it is right. Good, good, okay. Many screens to manage here. Okay, still everything in place? Yeah. Okay, great, then I start. Great, so, yeah, thanks very much for uh, the kind invitation, Zainab and uh, Johannes and QBN in general. Uh, it's a great honor for me to speak here at the QBN leadership session on quantum computing. And thanks also to the other speakers for the interesting talks so far. Um, in my talk, uh, I will walk you through quantum computing as we perceive it and perform it at uh, Fraunhofer IAF and embed that also somewhat in the bigger picture, the kind of status quo. So let me first start with an introduction to what Fraunhofer IAF actually is. Uh, Fraunhofer IAF stands for the Fraunhofer Institute for Applied Solid State Physics. We are located in Freiburg in the southwest uh, of Germany in Baden-Württemberg and Fraunhofer IAF was actually founded in 1957 as only the fifth institute of the Fraunhofer Society, which I learned recently when the Fraunhofer Society turned 75 years old. By now it has 76 institutes and 30,000 employees and thereby is the largest applied research organization in Europe and quantum computing is definitely applied. I think this conclusion we can clearly make. Um, our institute has about 300 employees in total uh, who conduct research on the field of uh, three, five semiconductors on the one hand and synthetic diamond on the other hand. And we develop devices based on these technologies. The Institute is structured into five business units. The more traditional ones um, deal with high frequency electronics, power electronics, and uh, yeah, power electronics and optoelectronics. And the more recently established ones are the ones starting with quantum. So there is quantum components. I don't know, do you see my mouse potentially? Yeah, we can see it. Let's hope you see it, okay? And quantum components focuses mostly on quantum sensors. And then uh, business unit five is called uh, quantum systems. That's actually the one I lead. And we mostly focus on quantum computing, both uh, in, in, on the hardware side and on the software side. Uh, and that's what I'm going to focus on in my talk. And the embed embedding, of course, uh, in the current situation. Uh, in the field. So our activities in the business unit are structured as follows. We perform material synthesis for diamond-based quantum technologies. That's going to be the key focus of my talk. We develop quantum computer hardware based on spin qubits in diamond. We characterize and simulate quantum computing platforms of various sorts. And we design hardware optimized quantum algorithms uh, for use cases in simulation, in optimization, and also in machine learning more recently. But to put first things first, uh, uh, we start with the underlying hardware. And for us, that mostly means diamonds. 
So what are diamond quantum technologies like? The workhorse of diamond quantum technologies is the so-called nitrogen vacancy, or in short, NV center in diamond. You get an NV center if you take a piece of diamond that consists of carbon-12 atoms, the green beads here, and then you remove two of these carbon atoms. In one of the spots, you put a nitrogen atom, and the other spot is empty. There is a so-called that's a so-called vacancy, and then the excess electron from the nitrogen goes into that vacancy. And this electron is actually what we can control. So we can control and read out the electronic spin in the vacancy using light and microwave fields. And this platform is somewhat different from other ones. On the one hand, it's, it behaves like a trapped atom or trapped ion. On the other hand, it's in a solid. So some people call this nature's own ion trap. And that comes with a number of unique properties and advantages. So the, um, uh, there is a well-defined fluorescence. You can see here the level scheme. Um, you send in green light, which excites the electron from ground levels to some excited levels, which then decay by emitting red light. That's what this picture also tells us. Green laser comes in, red light scatters out. And in doing so, you can initialize the qubit state. Actually, the qubit ground state, this m equals 0 state, is the lower state of the qubit. And m equals 1 is the upper state of the qubit. So you have a relatively stable uh, uh, qubit here. Um, these states of the qubit, you can then manipulate by sending in microwave pulses. So you can perform quantum logic on, the, on, the state, on these uh, states here. Now the question is, what's the lifetime of this qubit? The bare lifetime of the system is like milliseconds, so that doesn't sound particularly high. But you can use certain control techniques, for example, dynamical decouplings, and then you can make it up to seconds. That's quite reasonable. Now there is a, there is a trick that you can play. So you see these carbon atoms around the NV in the diamond. Now, sometimes these are not carbon-12, but carbon-13, another carbon isotope. And this carbon-13 has a nuclear spin, in addition to the electron spin of the NV center. And this, is also, this can also work as a qubit. And if you encode the information, not in the NV center itself, but in the nuclear spin of the surrounding carbon-13 atoms, then you can have a coherence time of up to minutes. Four minutes is the maximum, as has been demonstrated by the group of Jörg Brachtrup at the University of Stuttgart. So this is an extremely long-lived qubit. Another very nice uh, advantage of the NV center in diamond is the operation is in principle possible at room temperature, not only principle, but in fact possible at room temperature. And that's of course, I mean, we have heard it before, energy consumption is a thing. Uh, that's way less effort than uh, a kind of cryogenic uh, um, lab-sized uh, superconductor qubit facility, as we can see here. And also like energy consumption wise, it's very nice uh, as we'll see in the application uh, when I come to the applications and also sustainability wise, of course, this is, this is highly relevant as we, as we have heard in the previous talk. Um, just to reiterate, the NV center is atom-like, uh, but it's trapped in a solid. So there is no trap uh, required as in this trapped ion system or, or laser systems that are required for the trapping. Uh, as in atomic uh, systems, atomic qubits in, in general, we don't need here. And last but not least, carbon and nitrogen are the basis of the system. Um, and I don't need to convince you that those are cheap and abundant materials. It's somewhat of a challenge to put them in this form, but yeah, it's possible. Um, so the applications of the NV center or of um, diamond quantum technologies uh, as such are that we can think of mobile quantum devices now because this doesn't require trapping, does not require cryostats and so on and so forth. And the other aspect I think we touched upon this also in previous uh, uh, talks and discussions, that this is also cheaper as a fact. I mean, the, a device based on ND centers can be bought at a much lower price than the superconducting platform. And that's good for all sorts of technologies or um, yeah, or, or 
systems like quantum sensors, also for quantum communication, and then also quantum computers, for example, mobile quantum computers. I like to make this comparison, uh, like the vacuum tube uh, was a very established uh, hardware for classical computing and like was used in many use cases, so to speak, uh, in the past century. And um, at some point, however, the transistor was suggested and then a few decades later realized and has a lot of inherent advantages, uh, which then uh, made it into the yeah, leading uh, um, element of all of our uh, like uh, classical information processing devices today. I think there's a bit of a comparison here uh, between the more established like uh, quantum computing platforms, which where we have 100 qubits now and more, um, but they all like typically don't have these advantages. So these inherent advantages of the NV center and diamond or of color centers and diamond, uh, I think they may uh, give rise to you know advantages like this or, or a chance to realize uh, better quantum computers, better quantum devices in the future, which uh, yeah take advantage of these of these properties. But yeah, nothing comes for free, and that's why we have to do research on it. And there are different ways to realize diamond uh, quantum computing. Um, I'll walk you through them, at least to, through two of them, which we pursue. Um, so what is diamond quantum computing like? Um, for a quantum computer, there is clearly a requirement to have multiple or even many and well-defined controllable qubits and to connect them in a quantum way necessarily. And one way is NV clusters. So as I said before, there can be carbon-13 atoms around the uh, NV center in the electron spin. And these can be used as qubits with high coherence times, up to several minutes, and they are coupled through the so-called dipolar interaction, which is controllable. Um, this has been demonstrated for up to 50 spins. They have been mapped out around a single NV center in the group of Tim Taminyaw at TU Delft. Um, and this is also the, the principle that the commercial products, the commercial uh, like early quantum computers based on NV centers use. They're like produced and sold by uh, certain companies such as Quantum Brilliance, Saxon Q and XCQ. And they all exhibit a number of uh, well-controlled qubits which operate at room temperature, typically like four to eight. But as you can see, you can in principle map out 50. So maybe just this paradigm allows us to go to, go to a few tens of qubits um, or potentially higher, but of course we want to go to yet higher, like ideally hundreds and thousands and so on. How do we do that then? So we can extend this principle of the NV cluster to several clusters, um, which when, are, when they are positioned close to each other can also interact through the dipole force. Um, just like the NV center interacts with the nuclear spins, uh, the challenge here is that they need to be positioned very close to each other, like 10 nanometers and even below. And so we need nanoscale control on the positioning of the NV center, which NV centers, which is a fabrication challenge. On top of that, the readout can no longer be done through that fluorescence, which I showed you before, simply because of the diffraction limit. So we need electronic readout, but there are schemes for that. Uh, however, they need to be realized and integrated also at the nanometer precision. Of course, that's a challenge. It's a research effort for which we gathered a number of players, leading players uh, from Europe in a, Europe, in a EU Horizons project called Spinos. You may know Open SuperQ for superconductors or Millennium for ions. And here we are 12 partners from seven countries coordinated by us at Fraunhofer IAF who pursue uh, uh, color centers and V centers in diamond. And the goal is to demonstrate scalability beyond 10 qubits towards 100 qubits. So that's one endeavor, one route towards scalability of this kind of computing platform. The other one is a hybrid spin photon based quantum computer. So here, the idea is to integrate uh, photonically the NV centers. So you can see here NV centers, even the entire clusters in individual photonic resonators. The NV center gives a photon to the resonator, and from there it gets to the waveguide and is used to route and to prepare entanglement between multiple registers, multiple clusters of, of NVs with, with nuclear spins sitting in these resonators. And for that, you need a diamond chip in a sense, and that's what you see here. Uh, this is basically a photonic architecture, a photonic cluster, 
uh, uh, structure, sorry, uh, uh, used for this for this purpose. And that's something we are working on uh, in a BMBF project so called Spinning with 14 partners from Germany. There are other research and technology organizations. Again, we coordinated this one and universities and also industry who gather to perform development of materials and waveguides and cryostats. I'm going to say why soon, as well as control devices, software and computing protocols. So I'm going to say in a way, the whole stack. And the goal here is to realize a quantum processor with multiple spin, uh, with multiple qubit registers then based on color centers. Why do I say cryostats? Why do I say color centers? Because there are also other color centers than the NV and they have very good coupling properties uh, like in photonic uh, context, so with light. Uh, for example, the silicon vacancy center uh, here, also the uh, germanium vacancy center and tin vacancy, they're all somewhere in there. And they have these nice properties in the photonic context. On the other hand, they don't operate at room temperature. That's the, that's the catch. So for them, you need to cool down to like 20 Kelvin but if you know what, where the superconducting qubits operate, that's like 20 milli, milli Kelvin. So that's quite a difference. And this may be possible to realize in a micro cryostat and it's still reasonably mobile. So there is still a difference. It may not be room temperature, but kind of close, close to room temperature or high temperature. That is the, um, with that, I would like to sum up the diamond, uh, uh, the diamond direction. And I briefly uh, give an overview over the other research that we do. Uh, you may have seen pictures like this before. So uh, we also at Fraunhofer IF, we also work on electronics and algorithms for quantum computing with the goal to advance the performance of qubit technologies such as superconducting qubits and also semiconductor spin qubits. Uh, we develop also here uh, novel material structures and process technologies. And um, for that we need to also, or we offer also characterization of these hardware platforms and quality assurance and something that we generally do at, at uh, Fraunhofer IAF and at Fraunhofer Institute is research on novel packaging and assembly technologies. And then more on the software side, we do demand specific simulation also of hardware devices and use cases and programming of quantum algorithms. I have one, one more slide on that. Um, so what is important for us is always uh, the idea of software and hardware co-design because we have on the one hand, we have the hardware and then we have also an algorithm group. So we, we try to look at the interface and work at the interface of both. And we therefore we pursue various approaches to perform algorithms on actually NISC devices, known as the intermediate scale quantum systems uh, that are available uh, today. And uh, we know they have errors. So what we need to do and what we actually do is error characterization. So here, for example, you see how we mapped out crosstalk between various qubits at the IBM system one um, in Eningen. And once we have this uh, error model, once we get an improved error model, we can do, for example, error mitigation. Here you see zero noise extrapolation, where we statistically uh, uh, simulate the situation or analyze the situation where, uh, as if we didn't have any noise. Of course, that costs us statistics, but it brings down the error. And the algorithms that we uh, and hope to enhance with that, or that we are actually working on together with our partners, are uh, those for combinatorial optimization, like QAOA. You see the circuit here. Uh, also for quantum chemistry uh, and quantum machine learning more recently. So we have, we're working on a number of algorithms, for example, in the project CORA, which is called quantum optimization with resilient algorithms um, as, as uh, uh, supported by the Ministry for Economy of the state of Baden-Württemberg. Um, that was already my uh, short overview of our activities and the embedding in the field. Now comes the outlook to our activities, but also to how I think the field will develop. So at Fraunhofer IAF, we support and pioneer diamond technologies, uh, both quantum computing and sensing. We perform material development and qubit creation in diamond, um, especially of the uh, NV center at room temperature. Now it's very important for us and for everybody else to, I mean, now that we have the qubit with very nice properties to push the scalability frontier. And we do that in the two directions that I showed. It's the dipolar and the photonic coupling architectures. And in this context, what is really important is to be able to position the NV centers in the right place in a photonic structure or also in a, in a, a multi-cluster dipolar coupling uh, situation. So that's why we are uh, uh, looking into single ion implantation techniques 
in, in various ways and also others like this is also projects that we have with other partners from Europe and also other types of color centers are important and I think uh, in Germany and Europe and also the US and potentially other places in the world, people are looking to these other, other color centers to see what in the end is the best color center for which use case. Um, our quantum algorithms research um, does qubit and noise characterization in a more or less platform agnostic manner. I think that's very important now to do benchmarking also between the, the platforms, um, potentially all the way up to in the stack all the way to the uh, like use cases like quantum simulation and optimization algorithms. And in the new near future, we therefore hope to develop and also to gain access to novel and larger platforms where we can harness the advantages of NZV centers for computing and then potentially, hopefully, uh, get superior devices in the short or intermediate or long run. This specific I can be at this point. I would like to end with a quick advertisement also on the behalf of QBN. Uh, there is the work group Diamond Quantum Technologies, which uh, we established yeah, last year at the QBN meeting at Fraunhofer of IAF in May. Uh, that's meant to push our interests, uh, our joint interests in the community together. And uh, it's led by uh, yeah, Wolfgang Klesse from Quantum Brilliance, myself and Zeynep Tavakuli. Um, and we are currently in the process of developing a white paper um, on diamond quantum technologies. We already have some nice content on computing and also on sensing and soon also on communication. So if you're interested in joining this, I think it's, uh, it's never too late. Uh, we have some nice contents, but we're still happy to have more, have more input. Uh, here you find the link. So feel free to, to join and show up or go on the web page and, uh, yeah, follow the process there. Yeah, with that, I'm done with my overview uh, on the status quo. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Florentine. Thank you so much for the presentation. And we always welcome and embrace an advertisement for us. So we really enjoyed that on a special side. And, uh, and the question, uh, there is a question from Anuj. He's asking for the Envy Center in Diamond Technology. Is that enough? Is that mature enough to fill the need of quantum memory for commercial use? Here, the key resource is the long lifetime, the extremely long lifetime of the nuclear spin. So I think this is actually the, if you think of use case as an application, the memory where you don't need to perform many operations Right, because you have, for a computer, you have to compare, as I think we also heard in previous talks, the the gate time to the lifetime, right? But for the memory, you don't have to do much op many operations typically, unless you error correct it, which you may not even have to do if you have four minutes lifetime. So I think that NV centers are extremely well suited for quantum memories. That's my opinion based on the coherence times that we see and that, that were, were measured. Okay. So yeah, I totally much. agree. Is this also covered in the white paper, Florentine? If not, we should add it there. I'm sure we put <laughs> it in last times. Perfect. That sounds great. Also for you, Florentine, the question about the, the biggest challenge uh, in terms of diamond and uh, how the community can help you there. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, one thing that I didn't mention at all in the longer run is wafer size because the wafers are naturally smaller than for other technologies. But yeah, we have a project and uh, I guess others are lo looking into that as well. So this is this is possible. That's an engineering task. Uh, that's something to discuss with our material experts. We really have a, a history of decades in, in synthetic diamond. So if you're interested, reach out to me and I will reroute you um, because this is something we're actively working on. Then the implantation, I think I, I pointed that out, that is like there are devices and there are different different ways to implant single ions. I think Johannes, you know exactly what, I, what I'm talking about because you worked on that. I think it was in your masters, right? Um, and that, that has been a big challenge for a long time. And there are now devices that you can buy. I cannot say off the shelf because that's not what it is. It's they're big and you can shoot single ions and detect single ions, they, I mean, in solids once they have once they have been implanted and tune the depth of the implantation. But then the question is also what does the ion do to the, I mean the nitrogen here, do to the to the lattice. 
of course, you don't want to disturb the lattice too much. Also, you still have to anneal. The vacancy has to find the iron. And the various approaches of doing that. And this is something that, yeah, this is hard to do for, for many players in the field. So this is a bit where we see our mission, uh, the single iron implantation, um, uh, yeah, to, to push this and to support this for the next years and hopefully decades if necessary, yeah, as an RTO, such that we can offer scalable, uh, yeah, platforms or material solutions even to the startups that want to make those into quantum computers. Thank you very much. Okay. So, Florentia, I would thank you again for answering the question and your presentation. Uh, we Thanks have for having me. Oh, pleasure is ours. So, we would go on with our last speaker, Kim Xu from the Tra Quantum. Kim, now you can start sharing your screen and we are ready to hear from you. Great, thank you. All right, I'll take over screen sharing here. Mm -hmm. uh, let me get this in the presentation mode. You can see that? Yep, we see the presentation mode. Perfect. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you today. I'm with Terra Quantum and I'm head of product management and product marketing. And what I'll be talking to you about is our Quantum as a Service platform, which is called TQ42. And I'll walk you through an actual example of how to apply one of our machine learning algorithms that our uh, brilliant teams have created and talk to you a little bit about the application that we're looking for, because I do have a call to action at the end of this. And that is for you out there that are interested to start working with this and kind of uh, like what some of the other speakers were talking about earlier today, you know, get this out of the realm of physics and into the realm of business and into the realm of, of applications. So with all that being said, let me give you just a very brief overview of what Terra Quantum is. In case you're not familiar with us, we are globally based and we've got a team of about 200 quantum experts across the world. I am in the United States in the Washington DC area, but we have a huge contingent of folks in Europe as well as San Francisco and other places around the globe. Now we offer three main product areas, which are algorithms, compute and security. And we're doing R&D and product development in all three of those areas. But today we'll be focusing on the compute sector, sorry, the algorithm section and talking about TQ42. We also have a number of different clients that we've worked with across different industries. And I would love to take just a second and, and show you this so that you can get a sense of the type of problems that we're solving for clients. We're solving everything from LNG shipping optimization to satellite mission planning optimization. We're doing machine learning training and evaluation projects. And above, above all of this, um, also within the chemistry sector, automotive, et cetera, one of the main things that we are seeing from clients is that they want the ability to be hands-on. They want something that maybe we develop as a solution with them to be able to, that they can take it and kind of iterate on it maybe even play with some different uh, types of use cases on their own using algorithms that are within the TQ inventory. So with all that being said, this is kind of the impetus for our TQ42 platform. And the idea here is that those clients can take their industrial solutions and use our software with our algorithms and tools and libraries that we offer to accelerate solutions, do experimentation on their own. And then of course, we're there to support them with professional services if they need that. And on the back end, we've connected to different types of compute providers, classical and also quantum. We've got quantum simulators uh, with our partner QMware. And then we've also connected to other types of QPU providers on the back end. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Let me give you a very brief overview of what TQ42 is just so that you have a little bit more context. And then we're gonna jump into the demo. So at a very high level, this platform is intended to move from experiments to production. We want first and foremost for clients to be able to get in there, play around, find solutions that might work for them. This is gonna require a lot of experimentation probably with their teams. So we do have a team-based uh, responsibility-based permissions and control system. It's OAuth2 compliant. The main things that I want you to focus on are over here on the left. So first and foremost, we offer access to our world-class op optimization, machine learning, and simulation hybrid quantum algorithms. We allow you to train and apply machine learning models, both in a low-code interface, but also through our Python SDK, which is what I'm going to show you today. And then in the future, what we want is to allow clients and maybe extend our, our um, you know, client base to apply pre-tuned industry applications with no code required. Because of course, right now, as we've heard throughout the day today, 
this this entire industry is extremely technical and it's very focused on people who who know exactly what they're doing with the data science they know exactly how to how to kind of pre-process everything so it runs well they know exactly how to tune parameters and hyperparameters and select an algorithm some of us like myself i'll just tell you i uh, don't have that background in science and we don't have that background in, in academia either we're business so we want to be able to apply these solutions to real world use cases and we want it to be simple like picking something off the shelf so that is part of our roadmap and our long-term plan is to make this more accessible to all different types of users. Um, what I'm gonna show you today is because we're focusing most, mostly on our um, more technical users first to make sure that we are developing something that is adoptable, we're targeting data scientists and machine learning experts. And so therefore we are really putting a lot of our time and focus on our Python SDK. And so let me go ahead and jump out of this and I'm going to show you First, if you haven't seen it, please feel free to go check out tq42.com. That's our website. You can watch our video that kind of gives an introduction to what's going on and then get a, a better idea of how we're positioning our software platform here. We also have a publicly available GitHub repo for our SDK. Now, the only thing that's not, that's not ready yet um, is we are still in a closed beta. So we're only accepting beta clients that are kind of going through our bespoke process on the back end right now so that we, we aren't flooded with a ton of, of clients that are right off the street. We're just, we're not quite ready for that yet, but we do anticipate that we would release that sometime this year. So we're excited to see people uh, joining our waiting list. This is what our web interface looks like today. And obviously, like I mentioned, it will expand. It will include more low code elements in the future. But right now it is primarily going to be used for looking at and tracking your experiments that you're running with your team. So as an example, uh, right now, just to orient you, we're in an organization, which I could be working with multiple people in this organization. And I'm gonna jump in, I'm looking at a project. So the Blue Lake project is the one that I'm gonna show you just for demonstration purposes. And here, what you can see is that I have different experiments that might exist within this project. And I could be, you know, potentially segmenting them really however I want, however it makes sense for my team. Um, in this case, I've got one experiment under the Blue League project, and I have three data sets that are available to me. So this is nice because I maybe, as a business user, don't have the expertise of how to groom and prepare a data set, but maybe my data scientist does. But maybe that data scientist doesn't necessarily want to be the one to go in and, you know, be the machine learning expert who's fiddling with the parameters and hyperparameters. So by allowing everybody to kind of have a different role and potentially different permission to, to do things in the um, in our platform, it allows for a dynamic team-based functionality. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into this particular experiment and I'm gonna show you some of the recent experiments that just, just so you can kind of get a feel and then I'm gonna jump over to the Python notebook in a sec uh, second. Oh, sorry, the Jupyter notebook, which has Python in it. So in this example, what you're seeing is you're seeing all of the experiment runs that have occurred within this particular experiment. And within these experiment runs, I can see the type of hardware that I ran on. I can see who created the, the runs, the date, et cetera. And I can also see the status of each. If I wanted to go in and see the JSON results, I could just go in and view file here and copy. But probably the most likely scenario is that developers are going to be using this directly within their IDE or potentially you know, from a Jupyter Notebook. So one of the things that we have done with our SDK is we have developed a pretty substantial developer documentation, which is available here. And it's also uh, connected through our GitHub repo. And I'll show you an example just to kind of orient you. So one of our algorithms that we offer is TQNet. And TQNet is for machine learning, and it offers a variety of different layers that you can use. Some are classical, some are quantum, some are hybrid quantum. And you can combine these layers to produce a custom machine learning model that might suit your particular use case that you're trying to solve. So I'll show you an example of what our documentation looks like. This is another thing that we're looking for feedback on. So when we open our beta up to the public, we're very eager to see what the feedback is in terms of how usable is this? Are we giving the right types of examples? Is our code clear? So we're very eager to see what, what people have to say about that. And I'll give you a little bit more detail on that in a minute. Um, as an example, so in this case, what I'm doing is I want to build a custom model type, custom model architecture because maybe I have some 
particular type of business problem that I want to solve. And I just want to play around with it for now and kind of understand what the TQNet algorithm that TerraQuantum offers could do for me. So I can go into the GitHub repo and we actually have notebooks in here that are samples. So you can get started very easily with using some of these different Jupyter notebooks. This is one that I ran earlier today, just so you can, I'm not gonna go through and do it in real time, but I'll show you the results of what occurred. So this is just basically meant to be a quick start. So I'm importing everything that I need in terms of my protobuf layers. I'm getting set up with my organization because I've got multiple organizations that I belong to. Maybe in, in the real world, maybe you would only have one. So this would be simple for you. But in short, in these steps here, I'm just setting up my, my structure, getting my org, getting my project, and telling uh, the system where I want to run this experiment. And here we can see that we've provided both a classical example and a hybrid quantum example of how to build and train these machine learning models. So in this example, uh, this is getting started with the MLP, and that's one of our predefined model architectures. In here, what I can do as a, maybe a machine learning scientist or somebody who's is an expert at this, which I am not, by the way, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm posing, um, is I could go in and I could fiddle around with the different hyperparameters. And that's where our documentation comes into play because if I go into the different layers that are available, I can look and see, oh, okay, let's just take a look at, I don't know, let's look at the parallel hybrid quantum or parallel hybrid network layer. So in here, I am able to see the different types of hyperparameters that I can set and the available ranges for each of those. And in this case, what I can do is I can just go ahead and run this once I submit the, the uh, name of the model and then also the data set that it needs to run with. So this is where the teamwork comes into play. I've got somebody on my team who knew exactly what they needed to do to set up the data. They provided me the, the data set that was already in the Blue Lake project. And now I just went and grabbed this model or this data set ID, and I put it right here into the code. And I submitted the run. Immediately after I submitted the run, the status came back as queued. And when I went into my experiments table, and this is actually a great example, I, I would see that it was running. And when the results come back, I can actually pull for those results. I can see that the status was completed. And then here I can see the results that I was looking for regarding the uh, different types of losses, I can see the loss function and mean squared error, mean absolute error. So I'm looking at different types of accuracy levels and things like that. Um, in the hybrid quantum example, it's pretty much the same thing. One last thing that I wanna show you just for context is, now imagine that I wanna take this Jupyter notebook and I want to add some additional layers. I, I really wanna customize it now. So I just don't want something out of the box, but I want to maybe add some of these other layers that Terra Quantum makes available. So now what I can do is I can go in and grab the sample code from one of these other layers, and I can put it into this sequential model to train it however I want. And this is what I did actually the other day is out of the box, I had PQN in there, and I went in and added PHN. And so by adding that extra layer, I was able to customize the model architecture that I was building. And then obviously my results came back. So that is kind of the summary of what we're building and why we're building it. Don't be fooled. Uh, it's not just machine learning algorithms that we're offering. We're offering optimization algorithms as well. So we have um, Clearview Analytics from Divis, which is one of the companies we acquired last year. We have TetraOpt, which is a proprietary algorithm that we offer in the optimization space. And we also have QAnc, which is for quantum encoding. And you can run QAnc algorithms uh, on IBM, uh, which we've connected with, as well as IonQ right now. And we'll be continuing to expand our connection to different types of QPU pro <clears throat> excuse me, providers. So with that being said, I think I'll leave you with just the call to action, which is we're really eager to get people's feedback. And like I said, we're not quite open for the open beta yet but we would love for you to join the waiting list at tq42.com if you're interested in trying this out and kind of helping us to groom we would we would love to have your participation and we'll reach out to you any questions well kim thank you so much for the interesting presentation and i can say i for one will be joining the waiting list and i will also thank you for sharing your jupiter notebook and showing us how it works so for now, we are open to question. Everyone who has question can write it again in the Q&A box or raise the hand. So we will be open the mic for them. OK, 
there is one question. Uh, Jiri from the SWA is thanking you for the introduction, interesting introduction. And the question is, what kind of infrastructure is behind? Is this the quantum com com computing part simulated or is it hybrid? It's hybrid. So we're actually running on a lot of classical infrastructure. But like I said, you can run QInc on IBM and IonQ. And then we also are connecting with QMware, which is our uh, one of our partner companies. So they offer simulated qubits. Okay, yeah. Thank you. And yeah, it seems there is no more question. I will thank you again, Q. And we we'll wish to hear again and more from you and this platform. Thank so with me. this, yeah, I would just uh, share my screen for two. So with those slides. So first of all, I would thank all of you for being here. I would thank our speakers for being here and let us enjoy from the talk and presentation and let us know more about the quantum computing status quo. And for these quantum leadership sessions, we have more to come. We have the next leadership session on quantum computing benchmarking, which will be on 4th of the June. Next will be on the quantum sensing with the use cases on the 17th September. And the final leadership session for 2024 will be again on quantum computing, but again, in the use cases. And it will be held on 22nd October. So we wish to see you all there again in these sessions. I would ask you all to forget to do not forget to follow us on the LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and also YouTube. Uh, you can uh, be 